everyone at some point in their life wonders about the universe. Now, I'm a cosmologist, and it's my job to ask questions about the universe. I get to ask where the universe came from, how the universe got to be the way it is today, and what the universe might look like billions of years from now. And I have to say, I love my job. I've been doing my job for 20 years, and perhaps the biggest surprise I've had during that time is just how much things have changed in our understanding of the universe in the time that I've been involved with cosmology. So once upon a time, many people thought that these questions were simply impossible to answer. Other people thought that they knew the answers already. So cosmologists like me live between these two extremes. We believe that these questions can be answered. We know that we're making progress. But on the other hand, we're not about to run out of work anytime soon. So my job wouldn't be possible without the Big Bang. And I don't mean that in the obvious sense that if the universe began with the Big Bang, then nothing would be possible without the Big Bang. What I mean is it's the idea of the Big Bang that makes it possible for us to start thinking about where the universe came from. The idea that the universe was born from a giant cosmic fireball and has been expanding ever since. So today, the Big Bang is almost child's play. If you pick up a modern kid's book on space, there's a really good chance that it will tell you about the Big Bang at some point, how the universe began with the Big Bang and how the universe seems to be expanding. In the early 21st century, we're making space for the Big Bang in amongst what we tell our children. But when I was born in 1966, things were very different. In 1965, scientists stumbled over the afterglow of the Big Bang. They found what we now call the microwave background. So remember that phrase, because we're going to come back to it. This was breaking news. The New York Times was making space for the Big Bang on the front page and above the fold, as they say in the trade. As far as the professionals were concerned, in 1965, this was the moment when the Big Bang became part of our bedrock and fundamental understanding of the way that the universe works. And for cosmologists, discovering that the universe began with the Big Bang is like telling a mapmaker that the world is round. But once the mapmaker knows the basic shape, the job then is to complete the picture. And so I have a map here that's sort of made when the map makers were halfway through, that they got the point, you know, you can tell that they live in Europe if you live in the Pacific, because the bit in the south is looking a little bit rumpy. But what we, they eventually got the job finished. But when it comes to the universe, we're still working on it. We're still figuring out what the map of our universe looks like. But let, you tell me, let me tell you a few things that we do know. So we'll start with a little simple astrophysics. And believe it or not, some astrophysics is really very, very simple indeed. So I took a photo of a star from the end of my street, and that star is our sun. That's the first thing to know. The second thing is that there's 100 billion stars in this picture, also known as the Milky Way galaxy. So our sun lives in the Milky Way galaxy, and we see it as the bright band of light that stretches across the night sky on a moonless night. That's the second thing for us to know. The third thing, the universe is full of galaxies. They come in all shapes and sizes, but this one is a spiral galaxy, very, very much like our Milky Way. And like our Milky Way, it would be home to a few hundred billion stars. And in fact, there may be roughly as many galaxies in the universe as there are stars in the Milky Way. So now that we've got a head full of galaxies, here's the fourth thing. The galaxies are almost all moving away from us. And the further away a galaxy is from us, the faster it seems to be moving. So how do we make sense of this? How do we understand why this would be happening? So what are the tools of the trade that you use as a cosmologist? And it turns out, in order to have the idea of the Big Bang, we needed another idea, and that idea is a remarkable discovery about space and time. 99 years ago, in 1915, Albert Einstein was hard at work in wartime Berlin, in the depths of the First World War. And what he came up with, the idea that he came up with meant that he invented what we call, now call general relativity. In the thousands of years before 1915, no scientist or no person, no, no one had come up with what we would now call a scientific theory that looked like the Big Bang. In the dozen years that followed 1915, the Big Bang was discovered twice. The origin, the mathematical description of the Big Bang was found 
in the general theory of relativity. So after Einstein, it seemed that this was how a universe like ours wants to behave. And the way Einstein did it is that he made space come alive. Well, not, not literally alive, obviously, but let me tell you what I mean. Before Einstein, the ideas, our ideas about space and time had been formed by Isaac Newton, and it lasted for maybe 200 years. And for Newton, space and time are a stage like the one I'm standing on now. For, for Newton, the story of the universe plays out on the stage of space and time, but space and time itself do not change as the story of the universe happens. For Newton, space tells you where things happen, and time tells you where things happen. But in Einstein's universe, things change. In Einstein's universe, we have space-time. And in, when you, in Einstein's universe, the shape of space-time changes as matter moves around in the universe. So space is curved, and space-time is now one of the actors in the story, rather than simply the stage on which a story happens. So in Einstein's universe, the galaxies are receding from us, but they're also sitting still. And the reason is that the universe is continually making space between the galaxies. Making new space between the galaxy means that the galaxies move further away. There's no center in Einstein's universe. Or put another way, we're all at the center of Einstein's universe. New space is being created in the empty voids between the galaxies. From the perspective of general relativity, it's completely natural for a universe like ours to expand. Making space is what space wants to do. But to really get a sense of the universe, we need to measure it. So if we want to know how fast the universe is expanding, how fast is the universe making space? Well, we have a name for the number that describes this. In cosmology, we call it Hubble's constant. And in 1990, when I started my PhD, there were two schools of thought among astronomers and astrophysicists about exactly what Hubble's constant was, about what the value of that number was. If you ask one set of astronomers, they would tell you that it was around 50. If you ask another set of astronomers, they'll tell you that it was around 100. And it's a big difference between 50 and 100. Just get caught doing 100K in a 50K zone and try and talk your way out of the ticket. Those numbers are different from each other. Now, though, things are different. We're still arguing, because scientists love to argue about things. But today, there's a group of astronomers and astrophysicists who would say that Hubble's constant is maybe 68 or 67. And there's another group, no, 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 it's, it's 72. And those numbers are much, much closer to each other. So over the last 25 years, things have clearly changed. And what's changed is that my colleagues have been able to build instruments that are sensitive enough and powerful enough to be able to explore the global properties of the universe that we live in. Giant telescopes make it their nightly routine to look halfway across the universe and capture light from distant galaxies and tell us how fast they're moving. Likewise, the microwave background, I promised you it would come back. In 1990, when I started in cosmology, I started my PhD, we knew one or maybe two numbers about the microwave background. And the key number was that wherever we looked in the sky, the universe seemed to be pretty much the same temperature. That's 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, or 2.7 Kelvin. In 2013, the Planck satellite launched by the European Space Agency returned a map of the microwave background that showed us its temperature at every point in the sky. And the difference in temperature from point to point, parts in 100,000, tiny, tiny differences. And this map was so detailed and so beautiful that the New York Times once again made space for the Big Bang on the front page above the fold. And this map can tell us thousands and thousands of things about the universe. So as we have to do this, we, as we look at the universe um, more carefully, we have to make space in our head for another idea about the big, or another idea about the universe. This galaxy, it turns out it has 100 billion stars in it or so, but the gravitational field of a galaxy with 100 billion stars is not big enough to hold it together. So we'd like to understand what's going on. What is the mysterious force that holds this galaxy together? And, a, and an understanding about that came to me one day in a kind of unexpected way, not a, a scientific understanding, but an understanding of how it is that galaxies work. So with my family, I, I used to live in um, New Haven in Connecticut, which is in the Northeast United States, um, a little bit out of New York. And every year, New Haven would set up a Christmas tree on the green, the park in the center of town. And so my, my family and I, we went to see the Christmas tree, 
And the first snow of the year had fallen, so it was cold, and we were wrapped up against the snow. And we were taking photos of the Christmas tree, and you know how you do with the camera, you know, you look at them on the back of the, back of the camera once you've taken a photo, and we can see these little points of light. And my wife, Jolisa, who's a writer, turned to me and she said, you know, that, that image that we've got looks like something in space. And then she thought for a bit, and she said, you know, does that tree work like a galaxy? And I said, what do you mean? And she says, well, from the distance, what we see is the pretty lights. But it's the, it's the tree, the dark and invisible, that's holding the, galaxy, holding the Christmas tree together. And now, Jalisa is not an astrophysicist, but what this means is that all of us are making space in our heads for the ideas that we're discovering about the universe. And she's exactly right. This is why we believe that these galaxies hold together, because a skeleton of dark matter, what we call a halo of dark matter, provides the extra structure, the extra gravitational force that binds these galaxies together. We have no idea what the dark matter is. It's something we've never seen in our laboratories, and something that doesn't interact with light, something that doesn't emit light, and something that absorbs light. But we know that if it wasn't there, the universe, or at least the galaxies in the universe, would be unable to hold together. So then, you know, what we're learning, perhaps the most surprising thing about what we've learned about the universe, is that the universe is a complicated place. But on the other hand, it is also comprehensible. In my work, I regularly ask detailed questions about the universe. I have some hypothesis about what the universe was doing a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. I can calculate what the universe would look like today if that hypothesis was true. I can take that calculation and I can compare that to what my colleagues see when they point their instruments at the sky, and I can ask whether the predictions match um, the data that's been returned by these, these um, experiments and um, observations. And in the process, we're able to ask questions about our universe that would have been un unbelie beyond the possibility of answering 20 years ago. We'll and we haven't got all of the answers yet, but in the process, we have made space in our heads for the dark and invisible universe that we live in, just as we made space in our heads for the fact that our sun is a star, that our star lives in a galaxy, and that our universe is full of galaxies that are moving away from us. And most of all, we have made space in our heads for the Big Bang, and the knowledge that the explosion that started the universe is still making space today.